Hey guys, uh, welcome to Portico. Um, I'm Jacob. I'm a fourth year here at the BSM. Um, tonight we will have Christian Hogan uh, teaching, and then, but before then we have uh, the worship band.
and thank you that there is mercy is new every morning. Father, please prepare our hearts for what we're about to hear. God, please give us hearts of worship, hearts of prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Please help us to love you more tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey everyone, my name is Jamie. I'm on staff here at the BSN. As some of you may know, this week is Holy Week. And this week is a week that we as Christians remember the events leading up to Jesus' death and we celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And we do this because Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are all part of God's redemptive plan for us. Because although God created us to be in a relationship with him, we are sinful, and our sin separates from him, us from him because he is holy. And so the Bible tells us that there has to be a sacrifice for that sin, that, that death is the only thing that pays the consequence um, for sin. And so Jesus' death, his sacrifice, enables us to have a relationship with God. If that seems confusing to you, please ask someone in your group right now or a staff member, or someone that you know who knows and loves Jesus, um, ask them what that means, if you're curious about um, yeah, what that means. So for our prayer time today, we're going to take some time to remember what that means. Um, so today is Maundy Thursday. This is a day where we remember the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. It's where they shared a meal together, and Jesus foretold his death. And then he took a moment to wash his disciples' feet in an act of humility and love and service. And he commanded them to do the same for other people. He said, as I have loved you, so you should love one another. So for our prayer time, we're going to take a moment first to reflect. As we often do as Christians, we, we take the Lord's Supper, and that's a moment where we remember the sacrifice of Jesus and his painful death. So take a moment and reflect and ask yourself prayerfully, what does the sacrifice of Jesus mean for my life? What, what significance has his death had in my own life? Prayerfully thank God for that. Thank God for the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Then we're going to move into a time and we're going to pray together. And as Jesus washed the disciples' feet and commanded them to serve and love one another, we are going to take some time to pray together and, and think through who are the people in your life that you can love and serve this week leading up to Jesus' death, at the celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection. As you, as you think about that, who, who can you love and serve like this? Who has God put in your life? And, and if you can't think of anybody, ask God to send those people into your life. So we'll throw those th two things up on the screen, take some time to reflect on your own, and then gather with a group of two or three people and pray for those people that you can love and serve. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Christian Hogan. I work here at the BSM. Um, and first, I just want to say welcome. We're excited that you're here. If you're online or uh, maybe in a small group somewhere, we, uh, we just want to say we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here to listen to God's word. Um, last week, we talked about Acts 17, where Paul was in Athens. Uh, as he was there, he saw idolatry and confronted it. And to the people said, this thing you say is unknown, I proclaim to you is known. Uh, in our groups, we really talked about how we should respond to idolatry on campus and how we can share God is living and supreme above those things. Um, so today we're going to continue in Acts 19, uh, but to fill in the gap a little bit, in, between Acts 17 and Acts 19, um, there's actually years of time that go by. Uh, Paul travels from Athens and travels all around Asia and what um, is around Jerusalem, Israel today. Um, and he actually stops by a city, Ephesus, and while he's there, shares about Jesus' 
uh, crucifixion and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. And as he did, some people responded well. Um, and they actually said, stay. They responded well. They wanted him to stay there. But he said, um, I'm going to move on. I'll return if it's God's will. Um, so where we pick up, Paul's actually gone to Jerusalem and then came back to Ephesus. And so there, there are already believers, Christians there. He's there to encourage. Um, but he's spending most of his time sharing about Jesus in the synagogues and in public places. Um, and people are responding badly. They've maligned the way. They've maligned the way of Christianity. Um, so we're going to read in Acts 19, 11 through 20. Uh, if y'all can get your Bibles or phones uh, or whatever to find that. I'll give you a second. Cool. So again, that's Acts 19, 11 through 20. It says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, uh, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out. Seven sons of Seva, a Jewish chief or high priest, were doing this. Uh, one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Uh, then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this came to be known by the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Uh, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of these scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Um, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Um, so before we really get started, I kind of want to make a caveat. There's some things in here that uh, I feel like we don't really normally talk about. This has a lot to do with um, evil spirits and sorcery and burning scrolls and some things that seem on the uh, far edge and unfamiliar to us. And I just want to say that we're not really going to talk about that much today. Um, it, the point of this passage and what it says about us, our relationship to Jesus and who Jesus is, um, a lot of those things can kind of be distracting, but I want to acknowledge that there is, has been a lot of, at least in my life growing up, there was a lot of bad teaching about what those things are. Uh, but questions of, you know, what are demons, how do they act, we're not really going to talk about today. Um, but I think it is good to know that the culture um, that this is written in is different than today. Uh, we don't often think about evil spirits or angels and demons, and uh, I think that's an okay thing. Um, but as we look at this, we're looking at a culture where they uh, believe in these things and they see them as a legitimate threat. Uh, throughout Acts, almost every new city they go to, they are interacting with those that are afflicted by evil spirits. Um, so I wanna, we want to jump straight in. Um, this passage really hinges on one phrase that we're going to spend most of the time talking about. Um, when the sons of Seva um, use the name of Jesus, and they say, Jesus I know, um, the one, or sorry, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Um, yeah, I, we really want to focus on that phrase um, because it, it is the hinge of this passage. Um, it's what helps us know. Yeah, it, it's where we really get to see Jesus in this passage, and it's also where we get to see our relationship with him. Um, we see that all the power and authority um, belong to Jesus. This Spirit recognizes Jesus is above him. Um, he shows that by knowing Jesus, Paul is also recognized, that he shares in some of that power and authority, that he has safety and security from evil forces. Um, and we also see how the sons of Seva can't manipulate that. Even though they say in Jesus' name um, or use the word Lord, 
there's a difference in actually knowing God and trying to use him to get to your own ends. Um, so we're going to start and look at that phrase, Jesus I know, um, where the, the Spirit really does say, I know who Jesus is. And this seems weird to me. Uh, it probably feels odd to y'all. Um, James says that even the demons believe that God is one, and they shudder because of it. And it shows us that they're, they know who God is, they know who Jesus is, and they've known um, from the very beginning. Uh, we see that in the Bible that Jesus, through Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, all power and authority. Um, so Jesus created them, and even though he was God and of greater beauty and glory than those things, uh, he emptied himself and became flesh and blood just like us. Uh, even though he was in appearance like us, while Jesus was alive, he demonstrated his power over spiritual evil. So he constantly casted out demons, brought people back to life, uh, and most importantly, he didn't sin. Um, and having not sinned, he chose to die. The Bible says that uh, he chose this and that he might break or destroy the one who has the power of death, which is Satan, and deliver us who would have been subjected to slavery to those forces. Um, it's worth knowing that Jesus' life wasn't taken from him, but he said that he had the power to lay it down and to raise it back up. And now that he has been resurrected, he's alive and in heaven with God ruling, um, he's brought us. The Bible says that he's not ashamed um, that we are his brothers and sisters and that we essentially share in that position with him. Uh, because of our relationship with Jesus, we're no longer helpless or subjected to those evil spirits, but they're subjected to us, uh, which is a crazy thing. It, the, the realm of authority has shifted where um, in one place we had reason to be afraid. Now, because of Jesus, we've been raised to a place where we are secure and with him. Um, Romans 8.38 talks about this. Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither anything in the present or future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, so we've seen that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And because of it, we have a relationship with him and safety with him. Um, we see this through Paul. The, the Spirit says, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize. And Paul has been lifted up with Jesus. He has position that is given to him, not because he's anything in himself, but because of Jesus. Um, he demonstrates the effect of this relationship with Jesus by um, doing things that Jesus didn't even do through his own body while he was on earth. Um, Jesus healed people, but never is it recorded that um, his garments of clothing were taken and given to people that were sick or afflicted. Um, we know that this is a way of God testifying um, that the message that Paul was giving was true. Uh, we know that Paul isn't interested in power for power's sake. He's not interested in gaining authority or position. He doesn't want to be a king. Rather, he wants everyone to honor and worship God. That's uh, not about him. His focus isn't on developing miraculous powers, but it truly is on God. Um, we see Jesus when he talks to his disciples, says, I have given you authority over uh, all of the power of Satan. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subjected to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Um, this relationship we have with Jesus lets us share in his rule and authority, but the relationship is what's most important. Uh, Paul demonstrates that his focus is on a relationship with Jesus first. In contrast, we see the sons of Seva. Um, it says that they were both uh, sons of a high priest, but also essentially traveling exorcists. Um, what that likely looked like is they used or appealed to powers and authorities of spiritual beings that they may or may not have understood. Um, this can be things like rituals. Um, I saw a little bit of this a while back as I traveled to uh, Tanzania in Africa, and the uh, major, I guess, like religion in the tribal areas is what they call witch doctors. And uh, what they do is people that 
want power, invite spirits into themselves, and kind of it has a mob mentality where they're used as a gun or a threat to say, hey, give me some kind of tribute or I'll curse you. Or if their land or their crops have been cursed, then they'll hire someone to come and um, essentially ask that thing to leave. And they're appealing to uh, spirits that they don't know and that they don't understand. Um, this is what we see from the high priest. Uh, they use the name of Jesus, but they don't actually know anything about him but his sound. Uh, it's shown by the fact that they have to say the, the Jesus that Paul proclaims because they don't know him personally. Um, yeah. It almost seems like it was an experiment to them to see if it worked. It was just using Jesus for his utility. Um, we see in the Bible a lot this like, there, there's some familiar passages maybe where you've heard anything you ask in my name, where Jesus says anything you ask in my name will be given to you. Um, and so they use that phrase in my name, but I think all of us have experienced maybe as a kid going to God and say, in Jesus' name, I want a bike and not, not getting any kind of bike. Um, it's because that, that phrase, in the name of, is almost being like an envoy or a soldier, a messenger, someone that's carrying out the works of someone that's in authority over them. Um, I mean, these sons of Seba, they didn't have any kind of closeness, any kind of relationship with God, not like what we saw with Paul. Uh, it's not a magical spell to say, in Jesus' name. Um, we see even a more extreme version of this thought from Jesus. In Matthew 7, he says, um, on that day, but it's on the, in the judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I just declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Um, so we see that this power and authority um, is rooted and centered in what it means to know and have a relationship with God. See, so there's a difference in a relationship with God and using or manipulating the power of God, but that ultimately it's primarily about this relationship. Um, some of this feels to me really far off is I don't think about um, spirits or evil all the time. But I think this is something we still see and can do pretty easily. Uh, I think many of y'all, at least a few around, come from a word of faith movement background that says if we say things in the right way or, um, you know, just get it out there into the world, God will return it back to me in some way. Um, even in secular culture, there's an idea of speaking things into existence, like I'm going to get an A on this test. And if I just say it enough, it'll be true. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I've had many thoughts that are, if I can just ask God in the right way or stir up enough fervor or passion or effort, then God will give me an answer. Um, when my focus isn't about loving God at all, but it's just getting an answer. Um, I think it's easy, and even, easy even to see teaching ability or singing ability as good things that we can use to gain position. Um, the, we see in Seva, the sons of the high priest, they had some kind of position. They were sons of someone that was famous, held in esteem high up. Uh, but we know that Jesus is the real high priest. And when we have a relationship with him, we, we're his sons. In the same way, um, we have authority and position with him. Uh, so we look at this and maybe can ask, how do, this is a lot, um, how do we respond? We, we see some of the people's response and that they had that fear and awe of who God is. So they extolled or praised him. Um, so the, the, there were people that saw the dishonor, disgrace, running away naked and afraid of those that tried to manipulate God and those that believed and trusted um, were granted with miraculous signs, crazy things. Um, and it created a response of repentance. Uh, it says that they, they burned away scrolls and sorcery things, 
came to 50,000 drachmas. Some people think that's uh, a drachma was a day's wage, so people translate that to four to five million dollars worth of stuff today. Um, it was crazy. There's some cost to that. Uh, but the main first response we see is praising and turning to God. Uh, we remember in Luke 10, which we quoted earlier, that it says, don't rejoice in the power that you have, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Um, these are people modeling what it means to um, rejoice, honor uh, what God is doing because they have a relationship with God. Um, we also see people trust Jesus for the first time. Um, and may, maybe this is where you're at. Maybe you've never really considered what it means to be known by God and to know God. Uh, maybe you've been in a place where you've really thought about the transactional side of a relationship with God. Like, what can I give him? What can he give me? Um, I would invite you to um, look at this story. We know that God doesn't change. So the same God that was doing miracles, um, that was showing that the message Paul was giving was true, is the same God that lives now and still does these things today. Um, so yeah, I really want us to look at what, it, what does it mean to trust Jesus and how can we re- respond and praise? Uh, we see in verse 20, it says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Uh, God was using his power to, again, spread this message of having a relationship with God through Jesus. Um, I want to end by telling, which I probably should have asked him first, but a story from my dad. Uh, I mentioned already that a few years ago I went to Tanzania to tribal places with uh, my dad. He's from East Texas, grew up in Texas, and like most of us, um, I don't think has ever gone and studied what it, like what would it mean to be an exorcist or um, what are the roles that spiritual things have in my day-to-day life. Um, but we w- went to this foreign place where there was a different culture and we're going to individuals' homes um, and the very first day we were there, he walked to a family's home, and they came out to greet him. They sat under a big tree, um, and as we were all trained to do, he started sharing the story of Jesus using some illustrations on the ground with a stick. And as he, he kept sharing, uh, he got around to the point of finishing and asking them, like, do you want to respond to this? Uh, and as he did, out of the corner of his eye, he saw someone around the side of the house, like, writhing on the ground. Uh, so to him, it was a weird thing. And he was shocked, asked the translator next to him, who was more, like, local from the area, and said, hey, what's going on? He said, oh, that man is, like, has, he's like a witch doctor. He has demons inside of him. Um, and as I asked my dad about it later <laughs> and said, like, what's going through your head uh, he responded, uh, the overwhelming thought that nothing there was about him. Uh, he said it wasn't dramatic, like in a movie, but he was filled with the peace and security of knowing that God was close to him. Um, <laughs> so kind of asked, what, what do we do? I, I guess we'll go pray for him. So they went and prayed, uh, and a man who at one time was enslaved to um, evil spirits, came to, and he <laughs> asked the translator, hey, do, do we need to, like, go over the story of Jesus, what it means to have a relationship with God again? And the man uh, looked up and said, no, I heard all of it. I'm ready to follow Jesus right now. Um, and <laughs> uh, to this day, I'm still amazed at how non, non-dramatically he describes that moment. And it is clear that those moments aren't about us or the power we have, but really all about God. Um, and him confirming the message of forgiveness of sins through Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, I think if we trust that, we'll see what we do in verse 20, that in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Um, So I have some questions I want to leave with y'all. We didn't really go into detailed application, but I'm hoping we can do that in our our groups today. Um, But just some thoughts to questions maybe to live leave you with are, how can we be tempted to manipulate God? What are those ways that we can be um, those people that say in the name of Jesus, but aren't actually uh, wanting to be with God? Um, is, do you look to God first for security and safety? 
are you looking to that new position we have being raised up with Jesus? Uh, and lastly, what does it really mean to know God and be known by, by God? Um, anyway, so I thank you for going through this with me. Um, if y'all would be willing, I'm going to, let's pray together really quick. Um, God, we thank you for your word and that the stories in here are true and still speak to us today. Um, God, I pray that seeing your power and authority, we would learn to trust you deeper. Uh, I pray that you bless our conversations and that um, as we talk and discuss, uh, you would help draw us near to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Uh, so announcements coming up, leadership interviews are from April 7th to April 16th. Um, so if you're interested on joining leadership or continuing leadership, um, just go to longhornbsm.com slash leadership. And then the other announcement is uh, the end of the year banquet is on April 23rd. And so that'll be a good time. More info is coming later on that. And uh, now you're dismissed to your portico groups.